Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The FCC cites a North Dakota car dealership for causing harmful interference to cellular frequencies. The National Council of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators releases the brand new technician question pool into the public domain. The theme for the 2018 Hamvention is announced. Indonesian pirates are monitored on 7 MHz throughout Europe. Radio amateurs in New England states track a major winter storm. Amateurs on Marion Island are off the air and in survival mode. And the FCC is considering geo-targeting for specific emergency alerts. We will have all the details coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and a brand new amateur satellite that was launched this week. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here with information on the latest microprocessor security flaws called Meltdown and Spectre. Australia's own Anil Benshop, VK6FLAB, considers what is amateur radio and takes a look at some names in the hobby. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of his amateur radio history headlines. And we will have a hamvention talk by CBS television engineer Frosty Odin, N6ENV, on mountaintop repeaters. All this and more is straight ahead as edition number 985 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from Studio 2 in the very nondescript red brick building here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where the January thaw has come and gone and replacement snow is on the way, I'm W2XBS. And from a much warmer Studio 1 in Central Florida, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news, the FCC Enforcement Bureau called on a North Dakota auto dealership to stop operating devices that are causing interference to licensed radio operations and to comply with federal rules and regulations related to radio frequency devices. The Bureau released a citation and order on January 9th to Lithia Toyota of Grand Forks. The case stems from interference to a nearby Verizon wireless site that has been emanating from the dealership's outdoor lighting system. Specifically, Lithia is being cited for operating industrial, scientific, and medical equipment and causing harmful interference in violation of Section 18.111 Subpart B and Section 18.115 Subpart A of the Commission's rules, the Bureau said in the citation. The Enforcement Bureau said the dealership should take immediate steps to come into compliance with the Commission's rules, including eliminating the interference. The case dates back to April 2017 when Verizon Wireless complained to the FCC of radio emissions causing interference to a Verizon 700 MHz LTE site in Grand Forks. Verizon noticed that the interference appeared to correspond with the outdoor portal lighting schedule of the nearby dealership and it subsequently contacted a representative of Lithia Toyota which agreed to leave the portal lighting off for one evening. Verizon said that resulted in a considerable noise floor drop. Verizon contacted the FCC after Lithia failed to take corrective action, the FCC citation recounted. A March 2018 visit by an FCC field agent confirmed that the interference was coming from the dealership's portal lighting, which employed Philips model QL55W-840 induction lighting devices. The Enforcement Bureau's Denver office issued a warning to Lithia Toyota informing the dealership that it was operating an RF radiating device, an unintentional radiator, that was causing harmful interference to radio communications. The letter stated that the RF energy emanating from the device was detected between 776 and 787 MHz frequencies, which are reserved for cellular operation. Although the dealership orally agreed to make a good faith effort to resolve the problem, a conference call with Lithia and Verizon representatives last June 28th confirmed that the interference still had not been resolved. 
The FCC noted in the citation that the RF lighting devices at issue are ISM equipment regulated under Part 18 of the Commission's rules, which compel the operator to promptly take whatever steps may be necessary to eliminate the interference. Based on the foregoing evidence, we find that Lithia has violated the aforementioned regulations of the Commission's rules by failing to promptly eliminate the interference, the FCC said. Lithia has 30 days to provide a report to indicate corrective actions it has taken or will take to eliminate the problem. The FCC said failure to take action to resolve the interference could result in fines of up to $16,000 per day. The National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators has announced the release of the 2018 to 2022 Amateur Radio Element 2 Technician Class License Question Pool into the public domain. Each question pool must be published and made available to the public prior to its use as a question set from which individual examinations are developed. Amateurs are asked to alert the NCVEC question pool committee to any necessary corrections or typographical errors. The new technician license question pool contains 428 questions and it will become effective for all technician class license examinations starting on July 1st, 2018. The theme for Hamvention 2018 is Amateur Radio Serving the Community. Ron Kramer, KD8ENJ, Hamvention General Chairman, said the theme acknowledges the role that ham radio operators play in their communities, especially in time of emergencies. During recent disasters, hurricanes in Florida, Texas, and Puerto Rico, and wildfires in the West, amateur radio operators are once again called upon to provide emergency communication assistance when regular services fail or overtaxed, Kramer said. He said that in keeping in with the theme, Hamvention is planning to have forums on emergency communication and displays of amateur radio emergency communication vehicles. Disasters are not the only times that amateur radio operators contribute to their communities. Hams devote many hours to help keeping participants safe during parades, festivals, walks, runs, marathons, and numerous other community activities by providing auxiliary communication. Kramer thanked the many hams who actively volunteer with community groups and thanked the public and organizations for their support of amateur radio. Hamvention 2018 is being held May 18th through the 20th for the second year at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. For more information, go to www.hamvention.org. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System's December newsletter reports that many Indonesian pirates were heard on December 30th, 2017 in the 727.040 MHz range, upper sideband and lower sideband, active in 5 kHz increments, laughing, singing, and talking. Signals were reported to be rather strong in Europe. Adding to this mix were Chinese over-the-horizon radars on 7 and 14 megahertz, emitting 10 kilohertz wide bursts with durations of 3.8 and 7.6 seconds, and often jumping around in frequency. A Russian military system was transmitting DSB on 7.030 megahertz from Crimea, covering about 5.6 kilohertz for several days, according to the report from Wolf Handel DK2OM. Also in there were pirates from Russia, they were reported in the 3.5 to 3.6 MHz range, operating AM with unstable carriers. Radio Hargesa in Somalia has been broadcasting at 7.120 MHz. Radio Etraya and white noise jamming reported to be from Radio Ethiopia continued to be reported on 7.140 MHz and 7.180 MHz. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Researchers at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, have demonstrated that quantum physics might enable communication and mapping in locations where GPS, cell phones, and radio are not reliable or don't work at all, such as indoors, in urban canyons, underwater, and underground. NIST announced the technology advance on January 2nd. The technology may have marine, military, and surveying applications. The National Institute of Standards and Technology team is experimenting with very low frequency, digitally modulated magnetic signals, which propagate farther through buildings, water, and soil than conventional electromagnetic signals at higher frequencies. According to now-retired project leader Dave Howe, AD0MR, quote, 
The big issues with very low frequency communications, including magnetic radio, are poor receiver sensitivity and extremely limited bandwidth of existing transmitters and receivers. This means the data rate is zilch. The best magnetic field sensitivity is obtained using quantum sensors. The increased sensitivity leads, in principle, to better range. The quantum approach also offers a possibility to get high bandwidth communications like a cell phone has, close quote. The researchers have demonstrated detection of digitally modulated magnetic signals by a magnetic field sensor that relies on the quantum properties of rubidium atoms. The technique varies magnetic fields to modulate or control the frequency, specifically the horizontal and vertical positions of the signal's waveform produced by the atoms. The National Institute of Standards and Technology developed a direct current magnetometer that uses polarized light as a detector to measure the spin of rubidium atoms in a tiny glass cell induced by magnetic fields. Changes in the atom spin rate correspond to an oscillation in the DC magnetic fields, creating alternating current voltages at the light detector that are more useful for communications. The researchers hope to extend the range of low-frequency magnetic field signals by boosting the sensor sensitivity, suppressing noise more effectively, and increasing and efficiently using the sensor's bandwidth. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. Nominations are open for the ARRL's annual Philip J. McGann Memorial Silver Antenna Award, which recognizes and honors the efforts of individuals who create greater awareness and understanding services and benefits that amateur radio provides to the general public. The deadline to submit a nomination is May 19, 2018. Everyday public information coordinators, public information officers, and other public relation volunteers strive to keep amateur radio visible in their communities by publicizing and promoting special events to the media, by maintaining good relationship with local media news outlets, and by creating content for the social media as well as many other valuable activities. These efforts benefit us all. The award is named for journalist Philip J. McGann, WA2MBQ, who is an SK, the first chairman of the ARRL's Public Relations Committee, who helped reinvigorate the lead's commitment to public relations. Unfortunately, McGann never got to see how well his efforts paid off. To honor him, his friends in the New Hampshire Amateur Radio Association joined with the ARRL Board of Directors to pay a lasting tribute to the important contributions he made on behalf of amateur radio. The McGann Award will go to the radio amateur who has demonstrated success in amateur radio public relations and who best exemplifies McGann's volunteer spirit. Activities for which the McGann Award is presented include efforts specifically directed at focusing the media's and general public's attention on the value of amateur radio. This may include traditional methods, such as generating media coverage of a specific event, or non-traditional methods, such as hosting a radio show or being an active public speaker. A candidate's work must fit the definition of public relations, such as getting the message out to the people. The McGann Award recognizes the promotion of amateur radio to the non-amateur community. A candidate's work must fit the definition of public relations, such as getting the message out to people. The McGann Award recognizes the promotion of amateur radio to the non-amateur community, not for work within a club or organization that primarily benefits the amateur radio community. The award is given only to an individual who must be a full ARRL member in good standing at the time of nomination. The nomination must not be compensated for any public relations work involving amateur radio, including payment for articles, and may not be a current officer, director, or vice director, paid staff member, or member of the current selection committee. The specific criteria for nomination and the nomination form in PDF format are hosted on the ARRL website or email Dave Isker at ARRL headquarters and ask for the official Philip J. McGann Memorial Silver Award entry form. Past winners of the McGann form are listed here. Nominations must be received at ARRL headquarters by May 19th. The ARRL Public Relations Committee will recommend a winner, if any, to the ARRL Board of Directors will make a final determination at its July meeting. Federal Emergency Management Agency Region 10, which includes Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, will conduct a communications exercise on January 17th and on the third Wednesday of subsequent months during 2018 from 1500 to 2100 UTC. These exercises will use the 60-meter channels and will test and exercise interoperable communication between federal, state, 
local, tribal, and amateur radio for use during a major disaster in which the conventional telecommunication infrastructure has been significantly damaged or destroyed. FEMA Region 10 will use the call sign WGY 910. Other stations that may take part include, but are not limited to, other FEMA stations, the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Coast Guard, SHARES, the Department of Defense, and the National Weather Service. Stations both federal and amateur associated with agencies and organizations that provide response support in accordance with the National Response Framework are encouraged to participate. The COMEX will use all five 60-meter dial frequencies. 5.330.5 kHz, 5.346.5 kHz, 5.357.0 kHz, 5.371.5 kHz, and 5.403.5 kHz as part of the exercise. Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club members kept a close watch on the Thomas Fire after it broke out in early December. Using a variety of the club's analog and digital amateur radio assets, radio operators were able to observe firefighting efforts firsthand and pass along immediate information, often before it was reported by official sources or by local news media. The Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club operates five communication sites in Santa Barbara County, including sites on Diablo Peak on the mostly uninhabited Santa Cruz Island and on Santa Inez Peak. Starting in mid-December, a round-the-clock emergency net convened on two meters as commercial power for much of Santa Barbara County was cut and the fire descended on residential communities in Santa Barbara County, prompting multiple evacuation orders. With repeaters on generator power and many operators running on battery power, net traffic consisted of official information, including evacuation orders, live reports on the rapidly approaching fire line from operators who remained inside the mandatory evacuation area, related traffic about firefighting efforts, and wind and weather conditions. Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club volunteers set up an ad hoc remote receiving station to stream live fire ground and air communications audio over the internet internet and mesh network. As fire crews came off duty, one firefighter and amateur radio operator joined the net to offer a first-hand account of operations from an insider's perspective. Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club members also assisted visiting fire crews with mobile radio antenna repairs in the field. The largest in modern California history, the Thomas Fire caused devastating losses in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. In Ventura County, the Thomas Fire damaged or destroyed some amateur radio resources normally available to provide emergency communication. It was an amateur radio TV camera that caught the first images of the Thomas Fire on December 4th. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1912. The Titanic disaster points out the need for wireless regulation. The Radio Act of 1912 is passed, which limits private stations, i.e. amateurs, to 200 meters, a useless frequency. The number of private stations drops from an estimated 10,000 down to 1,200. 1913. Edwin Armstrong develops the regenerative receiver and also discovers that the audion, or triode, can oscillate. CW is born. 1914. The ARRL is organized by HP Maxim to help relay messages given the limited range on 200 meters at that time, only 25 miles. 1914 through 1917. The number of amateurs increases from 1,200 to over 6,000. The ARRL has an effective traffic handling network set up. David Sarnoff, the future head of RCA, proposes a radio music box receiver. DeForest and some amateurs make experimental broadcasts. The ARRL starts a little magazine called QST. 1917. The U.S. enters World War I. 
all amateurs are ordered to dismantle the receivers and transmitters. With no radio operations and 4,000 hams in uniform, QST ceases publication. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. WX1BOX, the amateur radio station at the National Weather Service office in Taunton, Massachusetts, joined numerous Skywarn nets across New England in activating for an early January nor'easter that brought significant coastal flooding, damaging winds, with hurricane force wind gusts downing trees and power lines, and heavy snow accumulations to the region. The eastern coast of New England experienced high snowfall rates, whiteout conditions, and even thunder snow. A dramatic drop in barometric pressure generated a so-called bomb cyclone. WX1BOX was active for 16.5 hours, supporting data gathering for the National Weather Service. Local and state emergency managers, broadcast media, and other agencies also use these reports for situational awareness during the storm and to assess the need for any later recovery efforts. The launch of AMSAT North America's Fox 1D CubeSat took place from India on January 12, UTC. The Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle flight had to be rescheduled from December 30th. AMSAT Vice President of Engineering Jerry Buxton and Zero JY delivered Fox 1D to Spaceflight Incorporated in Seattle last November for integration. In addition to a Fox 1 UVFM transponder, Fox 1D will carry several university experiments, including a MEMS gyro from Pennsylvania State University at Erie, a camera from Virginia Tech, and the University of Iowa's High Energy Radiation CubeSat Instrument Radiation Mapping Experiment. Fox 1D also carries the AMSAT L-band downshifter, which gives the option of utilizing a 1.2 GHz uplink for the FM transponder. The Fox 1D downlink will be on 145.88 MHz, and uplinks will be on 435.350 and 1267.350 MHz with a 67 hertz CTCSS switchable. In addition to the Fox 1D amateur payload, the PSLV carried the French PICSAT, which carries a VU FM transponder. PICSAT will perform space observations. The transponder uplink is 145.91 MHz. The downlink is 435.425 MHz. Some 30 smaller secondary payloads from India and the U.S. also launched, the AMSAT News Service reported. AMSAT said it will release FOX-1D's CAPS on its website as soon as they are known and it's seeking telemetry data on the CubeSat to assist with commissioning. Participation in telemetry collection by as many stations in as many parts of the world as possible is essential as AMSAT's engineering looks for successful startup indications of the general health and function of the satellite as it begins to acclimate to space, AMSAT said over the weekend. AMSAT advised those capturing telemetry using the Fox Telem software to check the upload to server option and to complete the ground station params section. If AMSAT engineering sees nominal values from a telemetry gathered, Fox 1D will be commanded from beacon mode to safe mode on the first good pass over the U.S. AMSAT said the on-orbit checkup procedure could be completed in a few days. AMSAT asks the amateur satellite community to refrain from using the transponder uplink while on-orbit testing is underway. Meanwhile, AMSAT UK reports that China will launch Hunan Amateur Radio Society's constellation of five similar 6U CubeSat spacecraft on January 17th from its Jiuquan Space Center. Identified as TY2 through TY6, the satellites will carry out ionospheric transmission detection experiments in addition to amateur radio, HF, VHF, and UHF retransmitting experiments in any narrowband mode. The constellation will also carry out intersatellite communication experiments that include amateur radio loads, Li-Fi high-speed LED digital downlink, and CW lamp signal communication experiments. Downlinks are on 70 centimeters using 9.6 kilobit per second GMSK and on 2.4 gigahertz and 5.8 gigahertz using 5 megabit per second OFDM.
And now, with his segment on working amateur radio satellites, here is AMSAT North America's own Bruce Page, KK5DO. As we were preparing this week's satellite news, our newest satellite, Fox 1 Delta, was launched at 10.59 p.m. on January 11th. Within the hour, the satellite should become operational and we should receive reports from hams around the world that have received the initial telemetry. In fact, Anatoly, UA9, UIZ, received telemetry around 0528 UTC. This makes for another amateur satellite in orbit. The satellite has many features, and if you would like to prepare your station for transmitting on 1.2 gig and receiving on 2 meter, or using the 70 centimeter transmit and receive on 2 meter, then you should look on amsat.org, scroll all the way to the bottom, where the Getting Ready for Fox 1D information is located. You can get your pre-launch caps, the steps for setting up your radio to adjust for Doppler, as well as information about the telemetry and the onboard science experiment. We will have more information next week about Fox 1 Delta and possibly its new AMSAT name, AO something. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Dave Hartzenberg, ZS1BCE on a second tour at a Marion Oil Research Station as part of the South African National Antarctic Program for more than a year now, reports that he's been off the air as ZS8Z since last November, when generator fuel at the Transvaal Cove base was restricted to its central purposes, and he doesn't expect to go back on the air before departing in May. Food also was in short supply, just one functioning generator remains, and the satellite system is down most of the time. Surviving now is our biggest challenge, Hartzenberg said. The South African Sunday Times reported on January 7th that the Department of Environmental Affairs told the 20-plus member science team the government could not afford to send a supply ship and counseled the researchers to tough it out at emergency quarters. The situation has led to frayed tempers, the re newspaper reported, with one team member turning violent. An Indian relief ship is reported to be on the way with food and fuel. The newspaper said that the Department of Environmental Affairs played down the seriousness of the situation claiming the reported unhinged team member was suffering strain and that the provisioning calamity was an inventory error that resulted in canned food going out of date. A vessel from South Africa is expected in April for the crew changeover. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakava, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. For show 2018. And of course we begin 2018 with a massive security flaw. What else? Wouldn't be wouldn't be a tech guy show without a massive security flaw. They're calling it Spectre or Meltdown, depending on the technology. <laughs> Spectre or Meltdown. And at first, when the first when the story first broke uh, earlier this week, we didn't know a whole lot about it. Now we do because it's been embargoed. It's been known by the companies involved for some months, and this is how it's supposed to work in the tech world. Security researchers, the good guys, discover a flaw, and they uh, and they notify the companies involved. Give them usually it's typically ninety days, three months to fix it, and then uh, they reveal it to the world. And the reason that they kind of a they give the company some time because they don't want to reveal it uh, and give bad guys you know a chance, but at the same time they don't want to keep it a secret forever because bad guys may discover it eventually. And so it's kind of important to get the companies to fix it promptly. And that's the little sword of Damocles hanging over these companies' heads. In this case, the companies, well, initially we thought it was Intel. Uh, in fact, Intel stock took a dive this week because of that. And it turns out, no, it's not just Intel. It's Intel. It's AMD. It's even ARM. It's many of the chips you use. If you have an iPhone, it's, it's the chip in the iPhone. It's the chip in your computer. No matter what operating system you use, it's almost certainly the chip in your computer. It's everywhere. It's now the technical details of this are complicated. They uh, they affect any 
processor that uses something called speculative branch prediction. Processors, in order to be speedy, starting in about the mid-90s, Intel started doing this, started guessing ahead at what the computer program was going to do. Right, we think you're going to take a left turn here. So just in case, we're going to go down that road. And if you decide not to, well, we'll back up and go right instead. But we've, we, we have a pretty, you know, and it works well enough that it does speed up the computer by a lot, 30 to 50%. It's really, it's a clever uh, hack. Unfortunately, <laughs> and it took them, I, you know, to Intel's credit, it took people 32 years to figure out how to hack it. But they did. A couple of researchers, a uh, number of researchers worked, working on this for some time, figured out that you could take advantage of this prediction to leak information from the cache. See, processors also, to speed themselves up, uh, store a lot of uh, what's going on in the in memory in the processor. And it turns out things like passwords and other stuff are stored there, along with every other kind of data. Everything you type, everything the computer thinks, it's all in there. And if you can play a little game on the computer with this speculative prediction and trick it into exposing some of that information in the cache, you might be able to read it. Now, this is a very... A, very difficult thing to do, and these hackers are quite impressive. By the way, they're white hat hackers. They're good guys. But, you know, and I don't know. I, you know, we they have written uh, examples of how this works. There's no guarantee they're going to get anything valuable, but they might. It also, you know, it it's not, a, it's not something in your average Joe's going to write a hack to do. Because then you, you, you get everything. You don't get just, like, passwords. You get everything, and you have to figure out what's what and so forth. But it's there. And it's a bad, bad bug. Such a bad bug that everybody's hair, they run around with their hair on fire. And you've probably even seen it on things like the Today Show and the Lightning News. I just wanted to let you know from a technical perspective what this means. First of all, uh, the processor companies, of course, working on fixes, mitigations for this. But so are the operating systems. In fact, Microsoft has had a fix for this in its Windows Insider pre-release version. That will be pushed. Some of it's been pushed out already to you without even maybe your knowledge. Didn't look like an update, perhaps. It just happened. And then the rest of it, I think, is going to be pushed out on Tuesday on Patch, patch Tuesday, you know, the second Tuesday of the month. Same thing with Apple. There have been some fixes, but apparently there are other problems, and so they're fixing those as well. But if you're using High Sierra, the latest version of the Apple operating system, and you've been applying your patches, you should be. You're up to 10.13.2. Again, a lot of these patches were just pushed out without your knowledge. You're just there. You should be safe. In other words, nothing to freak out about. Apple also says that they've patched the iPhone and the iPad. Some uh, Your Raspberry Pi, according to the Raspberry Pi folks, is not vulnerable. It's too dumb. <laughs> a simpler chip will be less vulnerable or not vulnerable at all because they don't do speculative branch prediction. <laughs> Apparently, the Raspberry Pi, they've said, no, we're not, we're not vulnerable. But most, uh, most, you know, you're... Your Chrome OS devices, your Android devices, most devices, this is such a common technique used in processors these days. Most of these devices are vulnerable and will need patches. And this just underscores the advice I've been giving so often, and you've heard it uh, so much, and I apologize for you know belaboring it, but do apply patches. When patches come out, they're very, very important. They're very important. and uh, And when you do those patches... You're fixing stuff that you may not even know you're fixing, but you are, you're fixing important stuff. Scott Hanselman had a very good tweet, I thought. <laughs> He's a programmer at Microsoft. He said, it's, you know, this is hard to explain to non-technical people. So he had a, um, <laughs> he had a tweet. It, it was able to get it into 280 characters. Let me see if I can find it. Where he explains this, he says, to his uh, non-technical spouse, he says, uh, this is, imagine this dialogue. Honey, you know how we finish each other's sandwiches? No, no sentences. But you guessed sandwiches, and it was in your mind for an instant. If that had been a password, and somebody stole it while it was there, fleeting, that's what this is like. Oh, that is bad. <laughs> I don't know, does that help explain it? Maybe not. <laughs> but it's that, it's that speculative branch prediction, like, you're going to go this way, I'm going to store this stuff in from the cache that you might be going to and and a process can read it and it turns out you didn't go that way it doesn't matter i already got your password that kind of thing update now you probably read in the register and other places that these updates will slow the systems down and that's kind of true because the updates prevent this kind of 
caching and branch prediction. They require a state change in the processor each time. And that potentially, remember I told you the speculative prediction would actually speed up processors by 30 to 50%. Well, you turn it off, you could slow down processors by a lot, maybe as much as 5 to 30%. However, A, we need to do it. And B, I think there are going to be mitigations that don't slow it down. I think there's going to, I think they're going to solve this. And I don't see, you know, on the machines that I've been using, including, by the way, that new super fancy iMac Pro, I don't see a big slowdown. And my benchmarks aren't showing a slowdown. So I think, I think they're going to figure out ways to do this without slowing your system down. Nevertheless, you got to do it. It's a problem that a bug, a, a security flaw that affects all microprocessors. Not just AMD, not just Intel, not but ARM2, all of them. Any modern microprocessor, because it does this speculative branch prediction, is vulnerable to it, and they're, everybody's scrambling to get fixes out. They've actually been working for some time to get fixes out, and they, but they're trying to do, and this is always a problem with these bug fixes, is you, you can't just say, oh, well, I can, you know, we can fix that, just turn that off. You got to test it. You got to see, well, does that affect anybody? Does that cause problems? And sometimes it does. And you got to mess with it. You don't want to just push this out. At the same time, there's pressure to get it out quickly before the bad guys start writing tools to take advantage of it. This flaw would let somebody who could run a program on your computer, they'd have to be running a program on your computer, would it let them potentially get access to private information like passwords or credit card numbers? Well, actually, to all the information <laughs> that's stored in your cache. Memory caches, very fast memory on the processor, faster than the the L2 cache, faster than the, the, the hard drive cache. I mean, these are really fast caches, and that's where data that the processor's working on or thinks it'll be working on is stored in these caches. Well, one of these techniques called speculative execution turned out to have mm, a little flaw. It was really a hack. I mean, let's uh, let's call a spade a spade. It was really a hack. Intel did it first. AMD does it. Even the ARM processors, many of them do it. They speculate that ahead of time, what's going to happen? They peek ahead. And uh, again, it's very efficient if they peek correctly. But the peeking ahead also takes advantage of the L1 cache, the cache on chip, where it pulls data in from that cache getting ready to operate on it. And therein lies the problem. Normally, a program running on a computer doesn't have access to everything that's going on in the computer, just its own data space. But with clever tricks and timing, a program can look into the future and see what's in that L2 cache and save it. And sometimes in that L2 cache, you might see stuff from other programs, passwords, credit card numbers, that kind of thing. Now, it's a hit or miss kind of thing. So they might get a password. They might not. But that, you know, that's bad, obviously. They do have to get a program to run on your computer, but that's something bad guys do all the time. They trick you by sending you links in email or messaging that you click, and it says, oh, you need to update Flash. Go to this site and download the new Flash, except it's not Flash. It's the bad guy's program, and it's, you know, it's going to try to look into your cache and see if it can find any passwords. At this point, I, it's not something that is going to be a mass problem, but it's something we do have to fix. So don't, it's, your hair does not need to be on fire. You don't need to go crazy. Your operating system is almost certainly getting fixed if it isn't already. Windows and Macintosh have mostly been fixed. I, I gather there's still some more fixes to come. Linux, in fact, the way we learned about this is that Linux fix was being done kind of in public so people could figure it out. Even Operating systems like Dragonfly, FreeBSD, many of those are getting patched. Some are not. You should certainly check with your vendor. But if but mainstream computer users, you're, you're going to be fine. Your operating systems are going to be fixed. iPhone, fixed. iPad, fixed. I presume, now this is a problem with Android because the manufacturer has to support it, the carrier has to support it. A lot of times on Android phones, you don't get updates. It's one of the real advantages the iPhone has is Apple has been able to force everybody to accept their updates and push them out immediately. Apple pushes them out. So all the iPhones, they're, they're patched. Android phones, maybe not. Check. Get an update. Get whatever updates you can. But to my knowledge, at this point, no, there's no ex nobody's taken advantage of this. No exploitation of this flaw. So, but, but that will come. 
it's going to take a little more work to really weaponize it. So it's not something to panic about. Frankly, there, there have been worse flaws. There will be worse flaws. You should always be updating. Now, I suspect we're going to see more patches from uh, both Apple and Microsoft. And eventually, Intel, AMD, uh, and, the, and the people who make ARM chips, like Qualcomm, will all be doing patches for those chips, which might be the ultimate fix. So it's a it's a problem. It's not the worst problem we've seen. It's not. It's just more widespread than almost anything we've seen in a long time. It affects everybody. <laughs> I, I can't think of an exploit that's affected everybody like this before. It's a it's an interesting problem. It's a it's it's probably the most widespread security flaw we've ever seen. So that, in that respect, it's a big deal. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. From the cold but not very snowy Minneapolis studios of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY. Most ham operators east of the Rockies live on flatlands, generally speaking. Travel to Southern California, however, and the amateur radio VHF and UHF horizon undergo a radical change called mountains. While the phenomenal elevations of mountains out west provide extraordinary repeater and remote base coverage, there are some significant technical challenges that were faced even 20 years ago by repeater owners like CBS Television Technical Director Frosty Odin, N6 ENV. Digital controllers, the brain of the repeater, were already commonplace in the mid-1990s. However, Frosty experienced challenges with his seven 220 and 440 mountaintop repeaters that the average repeater owner did not. I needed a way to not only interface them all together, hook them all together, but also to be able to have 100% positive control. And I think we're entering an age in amateur radio where it's, it certainly is not too distant in the future that every auto patch call, every conversation will be full duplex. And let me digress just for a moment and, and explain that in the 1980s, most controllers for repeaters were half duplex. When I'm talking, don't interrupt me because I can't hear you. Full duplex means that as I talk, you can say, oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. You don't have to go on any further. I understand it. I think it's the best use of a repeater is to be able to carry on a conversation much as you would on a telephone. So to accommodate that, and again, this baby out with the bathwater idea was, why don't we just move into the 22nd century and start doing everything digitally so that once the signal was received, we converted it digitally and everything else was dealt digitally, all the switching, all the controlling, got rid of the squelch tail, went through what we call a central hub. We, we feed everything into a central mountaintop, and then from there it's turned around and sent back out to wherever it needs to go. And out of these seven repeaters, we can literally carry on three conversations simultaneously without anybody knowing that it's going on. And it's thanks to the beauty of the digital domain and the fact that we have a central hub that can route these to the mountaintops where they're needed. Plus, when a telephone call is made, now that rates are lower in some areas, we're able to route it to the cheapest phone line for that phone call. And so we save a lot of money doing it in the long run. Is all of this transparent to the end user? Totally transparent. He doesn't hear squelch tales. He can dial up and get an S meter reading out of which it comes back and it verbally tells you through a digital voice recorder, you are S9 plus 20. Here is your signal, and it turns around and plays back you giving your call letters, and you can literally hear how clear you are or not. Or if you dial up and you get an S meter reading and it comes back and you hear this loud PL that Joe has been telling you about for weeks, you finally actually get to hear it. Uh, this is only a small part of, of how the digital domain has allowed us to serve the end user. What is the problem of uh, having a number of remote links or remote receive sites is equalization at each one. And it's never quite as good as the on-site receive site. Does digital technology eliminate that variable? Very good question. First of all, the simplistic answer is yes, because we go farther back into the receiver to gain our audio. We go to the area that the PL comes out of 
the subtone that, that allows you access to uh, open up the receiver. It is pre-squelch. It is pre-equalization. So the controller actually handles everything and equalizes it in a digital domain. So we can customize that perfectly so that, say, a Spectrum receiver and a Motorola and a GE and a Majori and a, an ICOM and a Kenwood can all be used in the same system because we actually have the controller doing the re-equalization. Since it is pre-squelch, it's able to get rid of the squelch. So we kind of finally passed that, that great hurdle. I remember back when I was first licensed, I got something that I had read about from Heil Audio. It was all about how they were able to, to vote different systems. And it was according to signal strength, which one turned on the link transmitter first. And I thought, wow, what a brilliant idea. And then we went through the Doug Hall system and uh, the uh, GE voter system. And I was just always amazed at how they did this. Well, now we finally come to the point where all the link transmitters and all the receivers don't have to be the same. You just have to know what the differences are and make them the same through this digital system. What are the technical drawbacks, if any, of this type of system versus an analog system? I think the drawbacks are, are pretty universal. Your home computer, how you would treat that is how you have to treat this system. The way that we have accomplished it is each one of the link boards or each board that actually handles uh, each radio, whether it's the repeater, the link, uh, the control receiver, the auto patch, everything has a separate board. Each board has a uh, CPU on board, and then it all goes into a separate CPU that has a double CPU on board that basically process everything. So the care and feeding of a computer is identical to a mountaintop, and I do have a couple of mountaintops that are quite ferocious when it comes to power fluctuations, lightning, which... Uh, is why there are single boards that basically do the processing because they're almost like fuses. <laughs> you sacrifice that board if lightning travels down it somehow, even though we use polyphaser lightning arresters, we try to do everything as commercial as possible, but still something will slip by and we just sacrifice the board rather than the motherboard, the main computer. One of the products of having a repeater in an urban area or on a mountaintop where you have so many other transmitters in the area, of course, is uh, intermodulation. How does this digital linking eliminate those kind of problems? Well, first of all, the good old ethereal sky is still the product, and the antenna has to be of, of good manufacture, uh, especially in very high snow stormy conditions. When the signal is brought down, I always go through two cans of pass, two pass cans that basically eliminate the world around me. We have found that one can is not sufficient, and I don't care whether we're talking about 440 and, and the radar problems or if we're talking 220 or 2 meters. You need two cans of pass uh, virtually in, in any urbanized area. You always have these bad guys, and they're not all amateurs, that don't put isolators on their transmitters, and you have to suffer. And if it's right on your channel of receive, you better go find the guy because there's nothing you can do. Circulators are on the transmit side to keep intermodulation from mixing in your power amplifier, and we use a dual port isolator for that. Normally, circulators are on television transmitters and all that, but isolators are on the land mobile type equipment, the ferrous type. We use that on the transmit side to keep signals coming down the antenna from mixing in the PA. And on the receive side, we use two cans of pass. But anyway, the two cans of pass will keep all the other offenders from overtaking your receiver. And then a good, clean filtration system and crystal lattice and all the typical engineering ploys that you can use pretty much will filter all the rest of it out. And then you're ready to start processing this thing digitally, and it's just, just a beauty. What advantages are there in digital processing the links? we do not need to uh, quite have the bandwidth that uh, we needed for audio, surprisingly enough. We're not transmitting that much data, so we don't have to go that wide. Secondly, we can transmit things piggyback on people 
that never get repeated. When something's out going to a place we want to go to, it'll piggyback on that. They'll never hear it. You'll never hear it. It'll just go to the site and do the command that you want. We can get rid of a lot of monkey business on the system. First of all, when you're thinking full duplex, you're thinking receiver is one side and transmitter is the other. And when somebody comes on to goof around, we can turn off that receiver, we can change PLs, we can do all kinds of things. Not that the PLs will keep a strong signal from affecting it, but basically turn off that receiver and continue to transmit the information out of that repeater. We also try to educate our users as to what it is that we're trying to accomplish uh, when this happens so they pretty well know where they should go to continue their QSO. And lastly, we have a very dedicated group of amateurs under uh, uh, Gary and Derry and 6UU, who is just a masterful uh, DFer. What about monkey business on the links? Pretty hard to do monkey business on a digital link unless you understand how they operate. The way the digital stuff works is it will transmit down the link till it gets 100% recognition. And if it doesn't, it'll keep trying. Also, since we are a central hub, we have a hub that sees all of our sites, even though they're over 100 miles apart, each of them are. First of all, we use very high gain antennas. We have a very high threshold that must be maintained. The minimum I allow on the links is 13 dB. That's minimum. So it's pretty hard unless you're really high power to do anything and they're point to point on mountaintops looking at each other. So it's pretty hard to monkey with it, but this thing will keep trying. And then again, the point about the central link is that each of the repeaters knows what to do if it doesn't receive certain commands. They're already pre-programmed to know what to do. It's near impossible to, to mess it up. You've been listening to the thoughts of Frosty Odin, N6ENV, owner of seven, 220 and 440 repeaters that were networked together to blanket Southern California back in 1995. We'll conclude Hap Holly, KC9RP's conversation with Frosty next time. I'm Kent Peterson, KC0, DGY bidding you 73. Foundations of Amateur Radio. What is Amateur Radio? What's not part of the hobby and what is? The more you dig into this, the deeper the rabbit hole goes. I'll start with an analogy to set the scene. In aviation, Sir George Cayley was the first person to investigate heavier-than-air flying vehicles. He invented the aeroplane in 1799. The first full-size glider, built in 1849, carried the first person in history to fly, the ten-year-old son of one of his servants. Since then, the Wright brothers made their flight at Kitty Hawk. We saw the invention of commercial aviation, the turboprop, the jet engine, the space shuttle, helicopters, drones, rockets, hot air balloons, the Hindenburg, the Goodyear blimps, hang gliders, gyrocopters, and many, many other contraptions. Each of those are considered aviation, and the person controlling the device is considered a pilot. In amateur radio, we talk on the radio. We also create repeaters and talk on them. We link them together using whatever technology is available. We make it possible to connect to such networks using software such as Echolink, all Starlink, IRLP and other internet-based systems. We create digital networks with DMR, use Whisper to exchange information, make contacts using Codec2, have contests using CW and Morse code. We build software-defined radios where we use computers to decode and encode radio signals, test backscatter using all manner of signal processing, use packet radio, RITI, Hellschreiber and bounce signals off the moon and nearby meteors or an overflying aircraft. We make auto tuners with a Raspberry Pi or an SWR meter with an Arduino. We build valve based amplifiers and program MP3 voice keyers, GPS lock radios, map propagation using the internet, and have a rag chew on the local 2 meter repeater. We investigate 13 centimeter propagation, do experiments with amateur television, and we set up radio stations on top of mountains, in lighthouses, and on remote islands. All of this is amateur radio, and frankly, I've only just scratched the surface. There are heated discussions about if a link repeater using the internet to create the link is real amateur radio or not. Whether using your mobile phone as a node on the Echo Link network is real amateur radio or not. If using a computer to create contacts on a digital mode such as JT65 is real radio or not. Each of these questions highlights a misconception about our hobby. There are no boundaries in amateur radio. We're a bunch of inventors, mavericks, people who attempt the unthinkable, try the impossible and make progress. 
There are people who are passengers on planes, and there are people who fly them. There are people using technology, and there are people who invent it. We have a unique perspective as a community. We have the ability to imagine something that doesn't yet exist. Why would you spend any energy on whether that thing is real amateur radio or not? Amateur radio is a myriad of things, some of them related to antennas and radio spectrum, some not. This hobby is what you make of it. So go forth and invent something. Try something. Get on air and make some noise. The origin of names of things in amateur radio has a long and internet riddled history, with hearsay and false memories added. The humble BNC connector was patented in 1951. BNC doesn't stand for Baby N Connector, Bayonet N Connector, British Naval Connector, Berry Nice Connector, Berkeley Nucleonis Corporation, or any such name. Apparently, it's named after its inventors, Paul Neal and Carl Konselman, the Bayonet Neal Konselman Connector. They went on to invent the threaded Neal Konselman Connector, the TNC. A sub miniature version of these connectors came in three types. A, B, and C, called SMA, SMB, and SMC. Also, the N-type connector was invented by the very same Paul Neal at Bell Labs, and the C connector came from Carl. The Yagi antenna was invented in 1926 by Shintaro Uda in collaboration with Hidetsugu Yagi, both of Tohoku Imperial University in Japan. It's actually called a Yagi Uda antenna. Yagi described the antenna in English in 1928, and his name became associated with the antenna. The PL259 and SO239 connectors are not so clear-cut. The PL for plug and SO for socket seems to be agreed on. There are several explanations on the numbers, but the most persistent one seems to be that it is a US Army part number. They're also referred to as UHF connectors, and if you know that they were invented in the 1930s, you'll understand that UHF frequencies started at 30 MHz and above, which in practical terms meant 300 MHz. An interesting thing to note is that the standard banana plug mates properly with an SO239, so you can just plug your long wire straight into the socket. Of course we have the volt, the ohm, the ampere and the farad, named after Italian physicist Alessandro Volta, German physicist Georg Simon Ohm, French physicist and mathematician André Marie Ampère, and English physicist Michael Faraday. Everything is named after something. Sometimes we even remember what that was and where it came from. What things have you learnt about the names in amateur radio? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. Mounting repeater antennas upside down. When you're a repeater owner and you have the opportunity to move your system to a new tower, sometimes the mounting site you are offered is an upside down mount. This means your antenna will be hanging upside down from the way it's designed. Water can become a real problem in this instance. From time to time, I've had to deal with these placements too. Over the years, I have talked to technical people at different antenna manufacturers and run into the same methods of modifying antennas for upside down mounting. Generally, a fiberglass shroud encased antenna needs to be modified with the addition of two small holes you drill yourself. A 1 8 inch hole near the top cap or in the side near the top end will drain any water in the main body of the antenna. Those antennas that have a separate mount which consists of an aluminum tube with two clamps and a set screw, then the coax is fed through the tube and attached directly to the bottom of the antenna. You will need to drill another hole near the level of the connector. This will allow water to drain from the mounting tube instead of entering into the antenna body by way of the coax connector. Now you've modified your antenna for upside down mounting. There's one more problem. You'll need to seal the top end of the mounting tube to keep rainwater from entering in the first place. Here, I use silicone caulk. Be careful not to get any on the coax connector hardware. Some silicone cure systems can attack copper. I build a seal around the tube and the coax and apply more to the coax to form a small mound above the bottom of the mounting tube. After the caulking cures, you can add another sealant like coax seal for added protection. Don't forget to secure the coax during the curing time so holes don't form in the silicone plug you've just made. I've known of people using flaps cut from truck tire inner tubes to cover the entrance of the coax into the mounting tube. This also keeps sunlight off the silicone and is known to be very long lasting. 
The best philosophy is to use a few layers of protection, making sure each one is chemically different from the others. So if one fail, the others are different and more likely to survive. Here's a common repeater antenna failure I've seen. The common practice is to use a short jumper coax to go between the antenna and the upper end of the hard line. Be sure to secure as much of it to the antenna mount or sidearm. You want the jumper to move with the tower, antenna, and mounting hardware, but not flex much on its own. One of the most common failures I have seen in repeater systems is improperly installed jumper cable. The most common failure was flexing caused by the wind breaking the outer conductor of the coax jumper, perhaps even countered some others. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, January the 12th. Spaceweather.com reports that the sun's extreme ultraviolet and X-ray output has essentially flatlined. This translates to sharply reduced ionization in the Earth's atmosphere, and hams certainly know what that means. According to Space Weather, this, combined with the plummeting sunspot numbers, points to a deep and potentially long solar minimum. Forecasting the length of a solar minimum, however, is an inexact science at best. There is a tiny spot on the sun at the moment, but it's so weak it's barely worth mentioning. We have a stream of solar particles headed our way, and it's due to arrive Saturday, but the disruptions will be mostly confined to the polar regions. 80 and 40 meters should still be in decent shape for the North American CWQSO party contest this weekend. On VHF and UHF, keep your eyes out for band openings on two meters in southeastern Texas and northern New England in particular. FT8 digital operators are also reporting some sporadic E openings on six meters. Maxim Memorial Station W1AW will host a group that will take part in Amateur Radio Winter Field Day later this month. Sponsored by the Winter Field Day Association, Winter Field Day will take place over the January 27th and 28th weekend and it can be an opportune time to prep for a Laurel Field Day in June. Assuming the weather holds out, a group of hams will be here the last weekend of January to operate W1AW in the Winter Field Day, W1AW Station Manager Joe Garcia, NJ1Q, said last week. Headed by Frank Gitto, KA5VVI, the group will consist of members of the Warren County Amateur Radio Club, W2WCR, in New York. Gitto said the club is hoping to have an extra dozen members at W1AW operating in shifts of six. Garcia said the Warren County ARC operators will avoid the harsh elements and operate from indoors at W1AW in the home station category. According to the WFDA website, the Winter Field Day Association is a dedicated group of radio amateur operators who believe that emergency communication in a winter environment is just as important as the preparations and practice that is done each summer, but with some additional unique operating concerns. The WFDA said it believes that maintaining operational skills should not be limited to the fair weather scenarios. For the hardier within the amateur radio ranks, Winter Field Day is an excuse to get out of the house and enjoy the great outdoors. And let's face it, it's not cold and snowy everywhere during the winter. Gitto said that some Warren County ARC members will be operating WFD from Indian Lake, New York using special event call sign W2C. The event, which got its start in 2007, is not restricted to North America. All amateur radio operators around the planet are invited to participate. And there are three categories, indoor, outdoor, and home. The rules are similar to those for AWRL field day. Operation will take place on all HF bands except 12, 17, 30, and 60 meters, as well as on VHF, UHF, and satellite. The event runs for 24 hours, US and Canadian stations exchange call sign, operating category, and AWRL or RAC section. The WFDA encourages both group and solo operation. As the WFDA says on its Facebook page, the object is winter fun.
The AM Rally special event once again is inviting operators to explore the original phone mode over the February 2nd through the 4th weekend. Co-sponsor Clark Burkhardt, N1BCG, said the event is intended to be both fun and educational. It encourages all radio amateurs to get on AM, possibly for the first time. Because of resurgent interest in AM, the event is also an opportunity for amateurs new to AM to learn about proper settings and get the most performance out of their station, whether it's modern, vintage, tube, transistor, software-defined, military, boat anchor, broadcast, home-brewed, or commercially made, Burgard said. The AM Rally website includes tips and suggestions for various transmitter types, as well as links to additional information. Certificates will be awarded for most states contacted and most contacts overall made by stations in the five power output classes. Some special recognitions will be made on an ad hoc basis, Burgard said. The AM Rally gets underway at 0000 UTC on Saturday, February 3rd, and concludes at 0700 UTC on Monday, February 5. Bands include 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, and 6 meters. The AM Rally, which was held in April, was a huge success with nearly 1,500 contacts reported on the 72 logs submitted. And finally this week, emergency alerts warning of flooding, tornadoes, or other looming disasters could be targeted to specific neighborhoods under proposed upgrades to the nation's emergency alert system, filling a gap exposed during Hurricane Harvey. The proposed changes, announced Tuesday by the FCC Chairman Agent Pai, would allow officials to use device-based geotargeting to send alerts to all the cell phones in areas as small as one-tenth of a mile in radius. The current wireless emergency alert system only allows officials to target all cell phones in a county. If adopted, it will be the single most important improvement to the nation's alerts and warnings infrastructure in years. The current system's lack of precision was particularly problematic during Hurricane Harvey, which overwhelmed 911 systems and forced officials to use mobile communications like Nextdoor and Zello to communicate with residents in dangerous areas. The 49-page proposal unveiled by Pi largely mirrors suggestions from some of the nation's largest public safety organizations. The recommendations, if approved at the FCC's January 30th meeting in Washington, would also require the upgrades to be implemented by November 2019, years earlier than had been requested by companies including AT&T and Verizon. Such changes have long been opposed by the nation's top telecommunications companies, which argue that the upgrades would be expensive and could potentially overload their networks. The FCC in 2016 quadrupled the maximum length of a wireless alert to 360 characters and pushed for more alerts in Spanish. But wireless carriers do not currently have to assist with narrowing alert targeting to specific neighborhoods and have lobbied heavily against any such requirements. But emergency management officials say those concerns should be secondary to the safety of Americans. In a Friday letter to the FCC, Leaders from five of the nation's largest public safety groups said the technology for implementing more precise alerts is already in place. Phones are capable of precise geotargeting today, and we should have access to these capabilities. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the Benton County Radio Operators Club repeater system on 145.290 MHz and 443.025 MHz in Northwest Arkansas following the Thursday evening BCRO repeater system 7 p.m. net. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, Amateur Radio Newsletters from Around the World, Sources on the Internet, and the Packet Bulletin Board Systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. 
This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.